Great. Thank we you. Are, we are here with another edition of History Happy Hour, and this is the uh, Patriots Day edition, although we're not going to be talking about no, Patriots not. Day. But it is the 245th anniversary of the glorious beginning of the American Revolution. Chris, and the Patriots overthrew the hated uh, British soldiers, and I'm sure you're ready to toast to that. <laughs> yeah, I got to London, where you are in London. And so um, I do have, I have uh, an Abbey Left beer is my happy hour drink today, but okay. I'm drinking it out of a um, Berghoff restaurant mug. So hoping yeah. for the great Berghoff restaurant to reopen sometime soon. Well, I, I, have, I have a Spitfire lager, Spitfire ale, sorry. Rick, that it looks, looks pretty drunk down already. Well, you know, <laughs> the sad day, hey, he's got the Oh. Joe's got his 29th got division mug. 29 Let's Go mug. Yeah. So I want to introduce our guest today. We've had some technical issues setting up, but, you know, we're hoping for the best. Um, uh, Joe Belkowski is a military historian who has written uh, eight books, I believe, on American forces fighting in World War II, including a very well-known series of books on uh, uh, D-Day with the... Uh, yeah, very uh, clear titles, Omaha Beach and Utah Beach, which I'm sure many of you have seen. And um, uh, he's also written a five-volume series on the 29th Division, hence the 29th Division mug there. Uh, and uh, that's perhaps lesser known, but also perhaps a little bit closer to his heart. So uh, we'll talk both about D-Day and the 29th Division, and we are delighted uh, with all the people who are joining us and invite you to ask your questions as well. And I'm going to start off with a very simple question for Joe, Chris, if yep. that's okay, and then I'm going to let you kind of dive in. Okay. Um, Joe, you've been writing about, first of all, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And You're welcome. Real pleasure. Real, I've been, yeah. You've been writing about World War II history for, I'd say, approximately 40 years. How did you get started? Well, that's a complex question. I probably got started because I'm a child of World War II. My father was a World War II veteran and when uh, taught the creed to me only I just the form that the World War II vets didn't talk about it, particularly to their families. Um, so it intrigued me. Uh, you know, the experience of a kid from New York, uh, you know, he was actually a trained lawyer. He became a lawyer in 1937. He was virtually blind in one eye and ended up in a combat outfit in the Philippines. So, wow. Um, how that happened became a driving interest for me. In 1980, I moved to Baltimore and much to my surprise, uh, many of my neighbors were D-Day veterans and uh, it didn't take much exploration to find out that this was the heart and soul of the 29th Infantry Division, which landed in the first wave on D-Day. And so short answer is that's how it all started. Chris, you want to jump in? Yeah, well, no, I mean, I, I'm a little starstruck because I, those books have been uh, pretty important for me ever since I read the first one. I think I've gone through three or four copies of uh, Beyond the Beachhead over the years, so I'm a little, I'm thrilled. Um, so, Joe, I know most of us take it for granted, but um, what's so kind of special or unique about the 29th? Why are they, would you say, different than the other divisions that were created for the war? Well, number one, it was a National Guard outfit, which, of course, implies that it had a regional uh, soul uh, overwhelmingly. Well, 100 percent at the time the division was called up, the division was from Virginia and Maryland with an entire regiment uh, from the city of Baltimore. Um, 
So, you know, it was, it, it was very intriguing to me to, you know, live among the men who were at the time way younger than we are right now. Right. And, um, of course, they had their moment in the sun, the first wave in, uh, at Omaha Beach. So, uh, you know, they were one of five U.S. Army divisions to land on D-Day, including those who came in by, by air. So, you know, that in itself is a very, you know, remarkably distinctive uh, achievement. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at the time I was exploring this, the whole concept of the, the so-called greatest generation had not even come close to uh, being discussed. And, you know, these men were still young and they were in their prime. I mean, I, I even knew the, the field grade officers, the majors, the colonels. And it gave me, you know, an amazing perspective from private up to the up to the top of the of the chain. Right. And um, and this was before people started to think of these of the men as special, and before they had really started to talk about their experience. Right. Right. I, you um, know, I, I, just jumping in, and two things. I'm gonna, Jar. I'm gonna ask you. Um, uh, sorry to let technical details intrude, but uh, you're talking to us on your phone. Why don't you turn off that laptop, laptop, or click out of Facebook? Because I think that might be what's causing our our uh, sound problems. Okay. And while we're doing that, I'm going to okay. say that. Um, yeah, I'm struck by something you just said. I mean, when I grew up, and I'm, I, you and I are almost the same age. Everybody's dad was in World War II, and and nobody talked about it, and nobody. Um, it, it wasn't even somehow connected to those people. I mean, we all knew they'd been in World War II, but it still seemed like it was one million years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm sure you had the experience I had that that you couldn't get a, a story out of them. You know, it was uh, my father lived some amazing experiences and. I could not get one word out of him yeah. uh, about what he lived. I, I do remember when I, he took me to England for my 18th birthday, and we saw the, the beating of retreat with the Queen's Household Regiment on, mm. on Horse Guards Parade, and he let slip at that moment when he saw that. He said, boy, he said he remembered how proud he was when his battalion marched out onto the parade field, and he felt like he was a soldier for the first time. That was the first time he ever said anything to me about it. Wow. But anyway, you know what I mean. Uh, they they didn't talk about it. Hey Joe, one of the one of the things that um, strikes me about the 29th that maybe you could add a little bit to a lot of the National Guard units when they get federalized, they lost a lot of that local flavor, that character. Whereas the 29th Division. Even you know the vets I talked to, I knew some 29th Division guys from Rhode Island. I knew some from New Jersey, uh, and they would universally say that it, it was a Virginia unit or it was a Maryland unit. It, it, the division seemed to keep that that regional identity. There were a couple of reasons for that. Um, number one, uh, you got to remember the 29th Division was called into federal service in February of 41, so it was eight months before Pearl Harbor. Right. That's a long time to have been in service in, in the peacetime yeah. for the men to have been drawn away from their civilian jobs. But the important point is that, you know, any National Guard unit around the country at that time was grossly understrained. Uh, you know, a company in the in the in the Fifth Regiment Armory, where I worked for years, would have had maybe 70, 80 guys, but the table of organization called for 220 men. Right. So the moment the division was called into service, they had to infuse draftees in such large numbers that immediately the draftees be outnumbered the original guardsmen. But unlike a lot of other National Guard divisions, the draftees were they were Baltimore kids. They were Virginia kids from the Shenandoah Valley. They were from Southern right. Pennsylvania. So the division retained regional flavor all the way right up until D. Um, and in particular, the high-ranking guy, both among enlisted and uh, officers, remained National Guard soldiers. You know, so a lot of the people who were running things 
were the old Virginia and Maryland National Guardsmen who had survived the weeding out process. And believe me, the weeding out process was extremely difficult. Yeah. I mean, if you couldn't do those 25 mile marches with 70 pounds on your back uh, across the English moors, you were pretty much done. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, short answer to your question is it retained the regional flavor, which didn't happen to most. Yeah. Um, what, you know, I, I, obviously that um, D-Day and the Normandy landings are, are the division's big moment, and that's where a lot of people first learn about them, and they kind of come into their consciousness of the war. But what um, were the guys aware of, you know, that they'd been selected to be this division, and did they, you know, there are lots of lots of GIs are getting sent to England. How do they? Get there, were they were the 29ers aware that they were going to be the first ashore and and all that? Pretty much, um, the the 29th was the fourth division to make it to England. Uh, they were preceded by the first division, the 34th division, and the first armored division. If you know your world, where those three preceding divisions got pulled out of Operation Torch, uh, the, right. the invasion of Africa. Yeah. So for a significant period of time, the 29th Division was alone as the only significant ground unit of the American Army in England. They used to derisively call the division England's own. <laughs> um, and, you know, grad, in 1943, as you well know, the Churchill and Roosevelt and the military chiefs uh, of America and Britain slowly, gradually, contentiously came to the conclusion that the invasion of Northwest Europe was going to happen. And, you know, the project man in the knew that they were going to be in that. I mean, they knew, they knew because they were training with landing craft. They knew because they were learning how to swim as a mandatory exercise. They, they knew because they were the first units to the so-called U.S. Army Assault Training Center, which is which was a place that essentially made an army division into a kind of Marine Corps division. Right. Uh, so, yes, they fully, fully knew it. And, you know, they, they, were, they were proud of it. It's hard, in this cynical age, it's hard to understand that men going into the meat grinder were, you know, essentially, you know, proud of their selection as uh, among the first to land in Normandy. And, you know, I never saw a man who didn't tell me that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you have a question? We, uh, well, I was going to, uh, Phil, uh, we, we invite everybody in the audience to ask questions. And uh, Phil Brzezinski had a question, so I'll just put it up. And he wanted to know, he said, can Joe give us more background on Norman Coda, the assistant division commander? Uh, who, you know, of course, a um, uh, very famous figure and also uh, played in the movie The Longest Day by Robert Mitchum. So that's uh, for people who don't know that much about D-Day as well, that might kind of center who that is. But can you tell us a little bit more about him, uh, Joe, and the role that he played? Sure. He's he one of the 29ers who I regret so much that I never met. But um, I think I know him in spirit. He was a, born outside of Boston in uh, Massachusetts, West Point class of 1917, a very prominent member of the 1st Infantry Division during Operation Torch, but he switched over to England to become the Assistant Division Commander of the 29th in early 44. And he essentially became the man who trained the division for D-Day. Uh, he was probably the most beloved soldier in the history of the division. He was, uh, you know, he was, he, he may have been the oldest man, most likely was the oldest man to land on Omaha Beach on D-Day. He was 51 years old and he came in about an hour after the first wave. He escaped death uh, numerous times on D-Day and, you know, I could go on forever, but he essentially saved the day repeatedly in the 29th Division sector by urging men forward. And I have to tell you that we're in the middle of a very, very 
dedicated effort to get him the Medal of Honor right now. It was turned down by the Army last year, but we're resubmitting. Uh, and uh, believe me, I, I have studied U.S. Army history since I've been in my 20s, and uh, I have never seen a case of uh, gallantry above and beyond the call of duty as, as strong as Norman Toda's on D-Day. Yeah. Uh, but he was not awarded the Medal of Honor, and he was a man who would never, of course, would have said a word, uh, uh, in, you know, at, never would have mentioned that shortcoming. But um, anyway, he's one of my heroes. Um, as an aside, he did not like Robert Mitchum to be the person <laughs> selected um, to play him in The Longest Day, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> hey, Joe, one of the one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, I'm curious about, I get it on a lot of my trips. Um, you write very movingly about the fighting in the Bokash country and how difficult it was. Um, but you also point out that, um, you know, we, we had some awareness that the, that the hedgerows were there. We had aerial photographs. Um, when I go to England, I notice where a lot of the 101st guys trained, there are hedgerows all around the place. So where, where was the disconnect there? How did, the, how did it become a much bigger deal than I guess they were prepared for? That's, that, is, that is one of the great questions related to the Normandy campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. My opinion about it is it was well understood uh, in Allied planning circles about the defensive implications of the hedgerows. There were many, in particularly on the British side of the planning, who had uh, had been entirely familiar with the nature of the hedgerows. Uh, men had retreated back through Normandy in 1940 and had understood what it was like. I will tell you that for the most part, the Norman hedgerows are unique. I mean, there are places in France where they're similar to that, such as in Brittany, but you typically don't see in Britain the type of, the type, and certainly not in the United States. Right. You don't see the earthen embankment type of hedgerow uh, that you see in Normandy. And as you well know, Chris, as you've been there, you have to see them to believe them. You can't yeah. read about them in books. They're, oh. you know, they're sweaty before occasion. But my opinion about that is that the high-level plan for D-Day was so focused, so correctly focused, on kicking in the door in the co on the coastline against an enemy, you know, the vaunted Atlantic Wall that it had four years to prepare, that the, the hedgerows and the problems that would follow were essentially ignored at the expense of doing everything within the planner's power to ensure that the amphibious element or the amphibious side of the of overlord would work, or Operation Neptune is more correct. So, and I also suppose that there was overconfidence, you know, that once the coastal crust had been broken, the penetration through Normandy was expected to be rapid. I mean, you know, St. Lo was expected to be captured within a week, and it turned out that it was 42 days. Um, so I guarantee you there were many, many men in, the, in Allied High Command who understood the that going through the hedgerows should the Germans solidify their defenses was going to be murder, and it was. Yeah. But they didn't have the time and the resources to focus on that at the expense of, of the amphibious side of things. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And that, that's, um, that's kind of... That's probably what you usually say, Chris. Well, yes, you've heard me say it. But I, I, I'm always curious about that. Um, <laughs> because invariably, when I'm driving around um, in England, where, again, where the 101st was training, uh, I'll be talking about the, the lead up to D-Day, and somebody will say, well, there's a hedgerow right over there. Then they see that one, and then I have to, you know, try to explain it. So I'm always kind of curious to get other people's take on that. Um, I always think part of it is the the amount of the I mean, the earth at the bottom can be up to six feet sometimes. I mean, and those things are wide, and it's it's just it's it just you know, and probably a even a 
small difference of a foot or two difference is a huge difference, even though it might not visually look that different in terms of trying to get a tank through or keep it from going belly up. I want to just tell everybody uh, again that our guest today is Joe Belkowski, who's an author and historian, military historian, and has written a number of books on um, uh, Europe, uh, on the American forces fighting in Europe, including uh, well-known uh, books on Utah Beach and uh, Omaha Beach, and as well as books on the 29th Infantry Division. Um, and we have uh, two questions. Uh, I'll start uh, if two questions from our, our, our viewers. Uh, and one is the topic we were just talking about, and that maybe we've already answered it. To essentially, what is the difference between the Norman hedgerows and the uh, hedgerows uh, uh, in England aside from the earthen base? And if there's any big difference there, um, I'm not sure. For me, the base is probably the biggest difference. I don't know if you guys have anything to add on that. Well, I mean, I, I think one of the differences... I would say the... No, go ahead, Chris. Oh, no, I was going to say, you know, the density, uh, both in terms of just how, how thick they are, uh, and the, the foliage kind of interweaving itself makes it very, very difficult. Um, and just the amount of them. I mean, the fields are a lot smaller. Like per mile, right? Yeah, you just have a greater density of them, um, which which makes it... You know, it's not just dealing with one individual hedge. It's it's this collection of them. Joe, you want to add to that? Yeah, the density of them is what makes them unique. And, of course, in addition to the earth and base, you know, believe me, I have unencumbered by a rifle and a backpack. I have had enormous difficulty getting myself over a Norman hedgerow. I've, you know... Uh, not to mention the physical hedgerow itself, you know, my skin was ripped to shreds by brambles. Um, uh, you know, not, you know, this is not taking into account having an enemy firing at one, crossing a hedgerow, uh, you know, not having really any idea of a sense of direction. Uh, that's another thing that makes those hedgerows unique. If you wander among the hedgerows, you quickly lose your orientation. Um, you know, and, you know, as an aside, they're stunningly beautiful. Yes. Um, when you can walk through some of these hidden, narrow lanes that wouldn't even take an automobile and be yeah. Yeah. completely enveloped on yeah. all sides, including on top by the shrubbery, it's almost like you're in an, an herbal tunnel. And uh, it's, it's an experience like no other you could ever have in your life. And of course, when you remember that the Germans were dug into these positions, like the professionals they were, I mean, you know, they, and I believe me, I have found German machine gun positions to this day dug into the corners of hedgerows and pitied the poor men who had to walk into those fields. You get a sense of how significant they were. So, Joe, I think um, I'm going to combine two questions here, Rick, and I want to get uh, one more question in about about the landings, and then I kind of like to move on because there's another story there that I want to talk about. But um, Thomas Benner and, and Rich Randall wanted to know. Well, Thomas wanted to know: um, Did the men know how much more difficult the landings, or how difficult the landings at Omaha were going to be? Uh, and Rich wanted to know maybe some of the reasons why you think the landings at Omaha were so much better worse than the ones that say Utah or the other beaches? Well, let's answer the first question. Uh, they, it depended on your emotional outlook. Uh, you know, I have met 29th Division soldiers who claim to have understood that it was near suicide what they were going to do and others who were <laughs> completely inculcated with optimism. Um, now, you got to remember that the Allied High Command was trying to, in, to impart confidence and optimism to the invasion troops from the word go. Uh, you probably have heard the legendary story of how General Omar Bradley went from camp to camp once the troops had learned of their mission, 
and, and gave pep talks to the 29th Division soldiers and said, you know, you men have to be confident. As you come into shore, you're going to be the benefactors of some of the greatest firepower ever exhibited in war. <laughs> and of course he was right. When you, when, you, when you thought about it in terms of pure numbers, you had 450 B-24 bombers, which was a just an absolutely incredible amount of firepower, and you also had the invasion fleet offshore. Uh, and you know, Bradley was so confident in this pre-invasion air and naval bombardment that the famous quote he gave, which was given to me by many people who heard it firsthand is, quote, you men should consider yourselves lucky as you come to shore, you are going to have ringside seats for the greatest show on earth. So, you know, if you were a confident young man, as I might have been, um, you could have believed that. But if you had seen army life and were a little bit more cynical and, you know, perhaps had come to the conclusion that a lot of things that the army said didn't come true, uh, you might have been not as confident, and unfortunately, it was those cynical men who were correct. Right. You know, a, you know. As an example, the commander of Company A of the 116th Infantry, who st who was the commanded the unit that stepped ashore in front of Dog Green Beach on at H hour, is reputed to have said to his executive officer Ray Nance. He said, "Ray, we're all going to be killed." And sadly, that nearly came true. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's the answer to the first part of your question. The second part is, you know, it's pretty easy. Omaha Beach is, you know, in terms of topography, is unique among the five invasion beaches. You know, I'll, I'll leave it to the people who've been there. You, you, you know, the bluffs and the cliffs are unique. <laughs> uh, to an invasion front. And, you know, it, it, the Germans had, they didn't have as many people as we now, as a lot of people think, defending the shoreline at Omaha, but they probably had slightly more and better troops than certainly Utah. But, you know, you don't want to discount what happened at Gold and Juneau either. I mean, there, there was significant resistance on those two beaches. But what made unique, uh, Omaha unique was that inability to get off the beach unless it was through the draws, <coughs> by necessity, up the bluffs between the draws. That was a unique problem. Anyway, right. yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that um, I like to emphasize, and Rick does, but I like to kind of turn the conversation to now is um, we have a tendency, uh, Americans in particular, to think, we land on June 6th, we get to the top of the bluffs, and then we just kind of march to Paris. Um, War's over. War's over. But no, but seriously, I mean, obviously that's just the first day of a very long campaign. So um, kind of take us up, to kind of highlights if you want, but talk a little bit about the division leading up to St. Lo, uh, which I guess is going to, you would say would be their next big objective. So I'd like to you talk about St. Lo and then move on um, and maybe then talk about Brest, which is a fight that totally is forgotten about, in my opinion. Sure. Well, you hit the nail on the head. D-Day was the first day of a very long war. And, you know, it was almost inconceivable to the division. They lost 1,800 of their best men on that one day. Right. Um, but the real tragedy, the real tragedy ensues in the next two months. And it's not just St. Lo, it's the more forgotten city of Veer, which was very similar to the campaign to St. Lo, take St. Lo. But the liberation of St. Lo and subsequently Veer cost the division 10,000, more than 10,000 men in two months. It's inconceivable. The uh, carnage that was uh, the division had to experience in the hedgerows, uh, you know, and, and also 
you know, the division had, as you pointed out earlier, had not learned to fight in the hedgerows adequately. It took a month before they really figured out how to do that. So, you know, losing 10,000 men in two months is something that you almost cannot conceive that any military unit could endure. Absolutely. Uh, but they did. Um, and that is one of the stunning things about any American or any allied fighting unit in World <clears throat> War II is that they could persevere in the, in the face of such tragedy, such chaos, such loss. You know, the division only really had a break of about five days once the Falaise Gap was shut. And as you said, Chris, they moved on to Brest and Brittany, and uh, they lost another 3,500 men seizing that fort against fanatical German defenders. Uh, and of course, the, the one story that very unfairly comes out of the Brest story is that the port of Brest was never used by the Allies. Uh, and that, of course, became very, very painful in retrospect for the division members who had to fight for that. Right. But of course, at the time, it is the classic case of Monday morning quarterbacking to right. think of it that way. Uh, and I do explain that in my books. Right. But again, um, you know, the lesson was being learned by the division that wherever you went, the fighting was going to be ferocious. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the additional 3,500 casualties seizing breasts you know, was leading the cynics in the division to, and, you know, I mentioned this in my book many times, they were, the cynics were remarking that the 29th division was actually a core of three separate divisions. It was a division in the field. It was a division in the hospital. And it was a division in the cemetery. So, I mean, that's, you know, was meant to be amusing, but of course there's tragedy behind that. Well, I mean, you know, again, and, you you know, would, I, sir, yeah. No, no, I was just gonna say, you would talk about this, but it, it is staggering given the level of loss, and remember, most of those losses are coming out of the fighting part of the division, right? So those 10,000 losses are coming out of the combat arms, how they can even stay a cohesive fighting force at all. Well, I mean, it, you know, this is a matter of some controversy today, but you know, the American army replacement system uh, from the very top, and the 29th Division was a microcosm of this, the replacement system ensured that men who were killed and wounded would be quickly, literally, replaced. And of course, you know, the heart and soul says that you can't take a man who trained in for four years for D-Day in Normandy and uh, have him be replaced from, by an anonymous fellow who had never been in combat before. Uh, you know, uh, and there was a lot of truth in that. There was a there was a tremendous cruelty to the replacements. There was a tremendous heartlessness to it. And believe me, mm -hmm. I had documented cases of replacements walking into the front line at dusk on one evening and being taken out on a stretcher the next morning dead. That happened more than once. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, in my books, I talk about the adaptability of the American army and it, you know, you cannot help but admire it. The 29th division with all of this carnage and loss and a very, very callous division commander who was nevertheless a great trainer of troops. He, he recognized that if the division was to depend on replacements, that the treatment of replacements had to be much, much more, uh, codified. So he made a dictum in the division, which was later copied by many other divisions, that no replacement could go into the line unless he had gone into his company in a rear area for at least three days. Hmm. Doesn't sound like that was much. It had at least okay. ensured that people would know who he was. Right. A simple thing. But, but in any case, you know, the understanding from the top is that the division had to keep going. It was part of the American grand strategy in World War II. Whatever the losses may be, and they were bad, the next day you had to go again. And, you know, the 29th Division was almost in continuous combat. Right. There were some exceptions late in the war from beginning to end, I mean, from D-Day to V-E-Day. Yeah. 
Do you know, Joe, why the division was kind of selected to be part of the, the breast to go to Brittany? Was there any particular reason they were sent there? I would say a couple of hints that the 29th division was so pitied because of the experience that it, this happened in the bulge. I'm getting ahead of the story, but when the Battle of the Bulge erupted in, on December 16th, 1944, um, the division on the left of the 29th division, the 2nd Armored Division, and the division on the right of the 29th Division, the 30th Infantry Division, were pulled out of the line to go right into the bulge. The 29th Division was, le was left in place. And right. I think part of that deal was, you know, hey, this was a, this was a D-Day division. And, you know, ironically, by being sent to Brest, they kind of thought that that was going to be a piece of cake. Right. It ended up being anything but, and it turned yeah. out that the, the, the campaign to seize Brest was, was much, much more severe than anything the division would have had had it gone directly to the front, you know, the main front line on the, on the, on the German frontier. The yeah. fighting at Brest was just classic trench, you know, and again, hedgerow warfare in which, you know, if you got 100 yards or 200 yards ahead in a day, that was good. Yeah. So, so I want to I want to dive down into the weeds at Brest for a moment, uh, Joe. And then maybe we, I know we have some other uh, D-Day questions. But uh, uh, as as Chris knows, and you may be aware, I wrote a book about a uh, the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops a unit known as the Ghost Army, a deception unit. And Chris knows I never fail to bring it up in conversation at any opportunity. But there is an overlap uh, from August 23rd through August 25th of 1944, because the, the Ghost Army is carrying out a deception in Brest, and part of that deception takes place in the area where the 29th Division is moving in on the 23rd of August. And uh, the deception is actually designed to draw attention toward the... Um, uh, flanks uh, at Brest, as opposed to uh, uh, the uh, where I guess the uh, Eighth Division is in the center. Um, of course, this isn't going to help the 29th at all, since they're there on the uh, American right flank at Brest. But um, there's a lot of confusion surrounding this deception. I simply wonder if any soldier in the 29th that you ever spoke to ever said anything that even hinted that they knew anything about that. Not once. Not one. Not once did Secrecy I was well maintained. Sorry, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Secrecy was well maintained. You know, I mean, it. The only thing, the common memory of Brest is that we were told it was going to be easy. We were told it would take a couple of days, and it turned out when the division, when the city surrendered, forty thousand Germans marched into our lines as prisoners. Yeah, that's a heck of a lot of men. But no, nothing about that secret operation. In fact, you know, you're teaching me something right now. Well, they were they were actually impersonating the the uh, elements of the sixth division, which had withdrawn uh, a week or so earlier when uh, some of these newer divisions were coming in there. The sixth armored division. They were impersonating the sixth right. armored division. They had inflatable tanks. They had sound effects. They were doing uh, other things. Uh, impersonating two combat commands of the 6th Armored Division uh, as part of the operations at Brest. Um, so, you know, Good just enough. curious. I'm never going to live when this I down. That edition of my book, it, that will go in. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I just oh, recently ordered another edition you need, Joe. I ordered another copy of the book. I hope it, uh, when it gets here that it has that in it already, but I don't know if you can operate quite that quickly. Hey, uh, Joe, I had a, this is an interesting question um, by, from Brian, who's a, a Marylander. Um, he wants to know, were there any uh, veterans of the 29th Division um, at, you know, there you go, at Omaha Beach, but I would say in the division in general that had served with the division uh, in the First World War? 
No. There were just a handful of World War One veterans. Most of them senior officers, like Oda, Gerhardt, the division commander. There was a legendary uh, non-commissioned officer who had served in World War One, but in the 29th division. There were a handful of men in their mid early to mid forties who had served in World War One who were acting who were acting in regimental and division headquarter companies, you know, as clerks and typists and things like that. But interestingly enough, the the forty six year old fellow who I mentioned, who's a legend in Baltimore to this day, of course no longer living. Um, gained a silver star at the age of forty six by uh, repelling an attack on the regimental headquarters of the 175th Infantry uh, by gathering up all the clerks and typists and, and, uh, and beating back a German tank attack. And for that, he gained a silver star at the age of 46. So, no, but realistically, virtually no World War I veterans. Do you know, kind of along those lines, do you know if there was any, how many uh, guys that landed with the division on June 6th were still with with the unit at the end? Well, that's a tough question to answer because, you know, the division was, and the Army as a whole on, in the European theater was very, very good about trying to get a wounded man back in with, yeah. his, with his original company. And in the 29th Division, that was pretty universal. Um, so you had a lot of men who were wounded in Normandy who come back later. Some of the wounds yeah. were so bad that the men were treated for six, seven, eight months in England, and then they come back toward the end of the war. But as, a, as, a, as an, you know, it's a great question, Chris, and one of the great stories of the 29th Division was in March 1945, they had one of their first breaks. And the one, many of the units were awarded the famous presidential unit citation for their heroism on, on D-Day, and they finally had the chance to make the awards in March of 45 in Germany. And General Gerhardt dictated that the guy of every company would be carried at the ceremony awarding the presidential unit citation by the D-Day vet. And lo and behold, Every single rifle company in the 115th Infantry did not have a single D-Day veteran left out of over 200, as you know, in a rifle mm -hmm. company. Some of the heavy weapons companies had some, of course, yes. the service company that, you know, the regimental headquarters company had some. But, you know, 97% of the guys were, were replacements. And it's a very poignant story because, you know, many, many, uh, the divi it, was, it was a different division by March of 1945, yeah. clearly. Well, you know, the reason I bring it up is I, I knew Bob Slaughter really well. And I remember one of the times I talked to him, you know, he was talking about at the end of the war and looking around and he said, he said, I felt very lonely, hmm. you know. I knew Bob very well as well, and uh, he was one of the great supporters when I was writing my first book on the 29th Division, a true friend. And um, he was wounded at Veer in Normandy, yeah. and he came as a, a perfect example of what I just said. I believe he came back around February of 45, mm -hmm. and you, you're exactly right. He probably did not know many of the people in his company. Yeah. Um, as an aside, he told me on VE Day when he was when they were when they were when they were parading for the last time as a combat unit, his sergeant came up and said, "Give me your watch. It's an army watch." And he yeah. and Bob Slaughter said, "Hey, that's my watch. I've been wearing that since D Day." And the guy said, "No, it's an army watch. I want it." And he gave up his watch. So, <laughs> you know, the, you know, it didn't didn't really matter that you had gone through Omaha Beach and were wounded, you know. <laughs> anyway, he was a great guy, and I, I miss him dearly. Yeah, um, he was a tremendous guy. So uh, I'd like to ask a, a question about uh, methodology, Joe. Uh, I'm focused more on your D-Day books than on the 29th books, but either way, um, 
uh, it seems to me that, uh, you know, obviously when you set out to write those books, there's a tremendous amount of material. There's original reports. There's eyewitness accounts from the time, eyewitness accounts from 20, 30, 40 years later. Um, how did you uh, decide what to use and what not to use? And how important was spending time on the ground there in Normandy? We always talk to our guests on tours about how you can't really understand it unless you go there. So the second part of the question is how important was spending time on the ground? Great question. Okay, first part of the question, I overwhelmingly was devoted to primary sources, you know, and by that I mean uh, unit reports, uh, uh, any, you know, uh, army documents to, that you could find at the National Archives or at the Military History Institute in Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. I mean, I had a perfect storm when I got into this as a young, hey, I was in my 20s when I first started doing this. It shows you how long ago that was. Um, but it was a perfect storm. I, I mean, I was trained as an academic. So, you know, the, the research into primary source materials was inculcated into me as the way to go. But I also had access to the men when they were still young, and not only that, men who had not yet really talked that much about it. And I, and there were so many of them still living that it was so easy to find those who were not only willing to talk, but those who had good memories and those who were also very accurate in their memories. So my books are overwhelmingly based on primary source documents and in a secondary sense, uh, veteran stories, but very, very selectively, only when they could be corroborated as best I could. There were a number of times when I knew I could be burned by stories that weren't necessarily, you know, they, I'm not saying anything about the veteran. They just may have been yeah. misremembered or the memory may have been hazy amid the fog of war. But, you know, Although I was trained as an academic, I was very, very blessed to have been employed as a historian within the army for a long time. And consequently, I didn't think of my works as academic books. I thought, I thought more of them as books for people who understood how the military functioned because I was living and working among current soldiers in uniform and watching how they trained and prepared for modern conflict. And it was extremely illuminating for me to write from that perspective about World War II. So I tried to make my books, you know, document very, very carefully, you know, rather than being acad purely academic, I wanted them to be precise um, accountings of how the military did things, supported by stories of the veteran. On to your second question. Uh, living in Normandy was absolutely instrumental for me. I don't think I could have written my two D-Day books without living in Normandy. I lived there in the summer of 2001, and at least for a month at, in that summer, I lived part of in Bayeux, and part of it in Colville. Hey, we all know Colville, right, right next to the U.S. cemetery off of Omaha Beach. And I lived in a beautiful ancient farmhouse that was a, a half mile walk down the Colville draw to the beach. And it was absolutely stunning and chilling and obviously uh, illuminating and informative to be able to do that every day. And do it at a time. You got to remember, the Normandy in 2001 was not the Normandy today. There were right. there were guides, but not as many guides as there are now, and tourism was not nearly nearly as high then as it is now. And the walks in solitude on Omaha Beach were absolutely integral to being. I would not have been able to do those books without walking every inch of that beach numerous times. And, you know, I was already well informed about D-Day because I had written the, the 29th Division Beyond the Beachhead book. 
And I had re read everything I could about D-Day uh, uh, before living there because my job was to give staff rides or tours to U.S. Army soldiers who were being bussed in from Germany. So it was part of my job to learn the intimate details of that beach. Yeah. And, you know, I, when I think about it now, I still get goosebumps when I think of the solitude standing on that beach, yeah. by, you know, at dawn, not a soul around. Anyway, that answers your question. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, well, I want to keep talking to you, but I have, there's some other questions and I'm going to combine uh, two of them that we've gotten here that are both asking a little bit about um, the role of air power uh, during the breakout and um, Americans' use of air power, and whether you thought you know it was effective, um, whether the, what the what the men thought of it, um, particularly in the Normandy campaign, but you know the war in general would be would, would be fine too. Well, it depends. I'll talk about the Normandy campaign, and it also yeah. depends if you're talking tactical air power or strategic air power. Okay. I think we're talking. Well, no, the attempt to use. You're talking tactical. Yeah. Okay, but you know. There's no question that, you know, uh, by the time the Normandy campaign ended, the American army still was not really uh, efficient at using tactical air power in support of ground troops. Uh, the, the, the methodology by which the troops could call for support from airplanes was clunky. It was... Uh, time consuming and it was not particularly efficient uh you know in the attack on saint lo which was a uh, eight days of brutal brutal combat um there was really only one example of uh, of a fighter bomber attack that did any help for the 29th division uh you know the army had not worked out the the system very well but on the on the bright side by the close of the Normandy campaign and the opening of the Brittany campaign, that kind of started to change very, very positively. The division stuck an officer in the G3 or operations element of its headquarters who was, whose job was to do nothing but track tactical air power in the vicinity of the division and have them on call at a moment's notice. So you find gradually starting in early September that air power starts to become increasingly potent in a tactical sense, and the men start to notice it more and more and more. Normandy, no, they very, very rarely noticed it. In fact, you know, there were, there were some egregious examples of tactical air power that went bad and, and accidentally killed a bunch of our own guys. Yeah. That's gonna happen. But by the fall campaign on the western, in the western frontiers of Germany, it had been refined to the point where it was genuinely useful. Um, and part of it, again, was the adaptability of the American army, you know, the ability to put an air officer in division headquarters who knew the language of the pilots, who knew how they operated, and knew how to keep them available was, was absolutely key. And by the time of the February 1945 crossing of the Roar River, which is really the beginning of the end for the Germans in the 29th Division sector, air power was just a, a, was an absolutely integral part of the American repertoire. Right. So, so Rick, I, I have a big wrap-up question, but I don't want to hog all the questions. So do you have... Well, I was going to, uh, unless it unless it's connected to your wrap-up question, I was going to ask uh, a question that somebody put up here. They okay. wanted to know how many members of the 29th Division are that you know of are still alive today. It's probably in the range of 200 or 100. 160, 180, m many of whom are obviously not in good health, many of whom are still not, you know, not really in touch with the division association. I mean, very, very dear friends of mine are, from the division are still living, a neighbor, 100 years old. If it weren't mm -hmm. for this coronavirus crisis, he'd be golfing right now. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, down to a precious few, uh, yeah. and and even more precious few who are mobile and able to get around. But you know, they're still there. And you know, at division reunions, and there will be a division reunion this September. I expect there will be a handful at that division reunion. The division reunion is in Gettysburg. I would say. So. Well, you know, it's it's some of the most moving. Uh, film footage I've ever seen is of the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, which would be in a quick math where it would be 1935 or something. And they still had thousands, 38, 38 still have thousands yeah. of people come to a, a, uh, um, an encampment there and they're, they were restaging pickets charge with old men walking across the, the fields and you know it's it's sort of hard to imagine that we're in that same place now 75 years out from from world war ii that they were there during the you know just a few years before um you know the pearl harbor really right yeah chris yeah, go we're you, coming on you, this June. yeah yeah you can well, take it away I, I guess one of the things i, I kind of like to get your thoughts on um, one of my pet peeves uh, are people that say that, um, you know, we won the war in the ETO just because there were so many of us, that the Germans were better at everything and they had better equipment, better soldiers, and ad nauseum. It was just so many allies that we couldn't help but win. Um, and what, what I have always felt, and you talk about so well in your books, is how we we as uh, our armies, our divisions adapted and changed and evolved. And by the end of the war, we're very, very good. Um, and I, I kind of like your thoughts on that. And if you want to use the 29th division as an example of that, that would be great. I couldn't have said it better, Chris. I mean, um, I'll jump ahead of the story, but the, you know, the, the division that jumped across the flood swollen Roar River at Ulick on February 23rd, 1945, uh, represented uh, an outfit that was part of an army that was superlative at everything it did. Uh, the, the German army could not have pulled that off. The engineering feats were magnificent. As I said, the air power had been had matured. Uh, the soldiers themselves were veterans. Uh, the overwhelming application of force at the right moment in time and at the right point in geography. The leadership had matured. Uh, you know, it, it does. I agree with you. It, it's, it's somewhat annoying to hear that we won by brute strength alone. The American army that you see that matures, particularly by the time of the Battle of the Bulge and after, is one of the finest military institutions that this country, the, the finest that this country has ever produced. Yeah. And I should also add that even when the units were green, as the 29th Division was on D-Day, uh, they were magnificent fighting outfits. George Marshall said at the very beginning, you know, in response to the disaster at Kasserine Pass, he said he wasn't so surprised at that because he said it would take two years to make a first class fighting outfit. And he was probably right. But, you know, there's also been a little bit of misapprehension about, you know, what a veteran unit was and what a green unit was. I'll tell you something. There was no unit better prepared mentally and physically to enter battle than the 29th Division was on D-Day. And not virtually not a single man in that outfit, outfit had seen a bullet fired against him. And um, that division was one of, you know, it, it, was, it was just the finest trained, best trained outfit that this army, I mean, obviously other divisions were equally trained, but I'm saying that the way the army prepared the divisions that made the overlord assault was magnificent. And uh, yes, we learned in Normandy, but the adaptability was 
truly impressive. So I agree with everything you said. Thanks, John. I agree with everything you say, Chris, also. But uh, Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been such a great pleasure thank to have you. So much. you. Uh, I know we had more questions than we could well, get answered uh, uh, on the broadcast, and maybe you can you can go back at your leisure, look at some of the comments, and offer a few thoughts to people uh, who posed questions in the comments there. And I want to just uh, you know, at the risk of of causing all sorts of technical potential issues, I want to just. Oh, did, yep, see, automatic, I did the wrong thing. I want to uh, show a couple of your uh, books so that... Um... Hey, you cut me out. Rick, can you hear me? Chris, can you hear me? I can hear you, Joe. Is Rick still talking? There we go. I'm super glad we didn't do that in the uh, during the broadcast because can you guys hear me Good now? Good to hear you. Guy? Yeah, okay. I can now I can hear you. But we're saying goodbye, so uh, oh, we'll all we say done? goodbye. We're done. This has been another edition of History Happy Hour, brought to you by Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. Thanks so much. Show. Show. We got. We got. We'll, Twenty nine. We'll let's go. Twenty nine. Let's go. Twenty nine. Let's go. Okay.